Over the last decade, this game has been climbing a long development ladder that began with a relatively basic pitch for another Wing Commander game. There was a lot more to it, but the essential goal was to modernize a concept from the 90s that remains fondly regarded by everyone who played it. While I never encountered Wing Commander in its day, I have encountered a ton of people who enjoyed it, especially since Star Citizen got rolling and dredged up all those nostalgic memories for them. I started hearing about this game back in 2016 and kept an eye on things before buying a copy around 2018. At the time, I was playing Elite Dangerous, so Star Citizen seemed like a logical transition, and one which looked to me like a somewhat risky bet on the future. I've bought into a few early access games on Steam that didn't go anywhere, and even when they failed or were abandoned, I never felt bad because a part of me likes taking small, calculated risks on ambitious projects that try to shake up the model. Around the gaming industry, there is a lot of shade being thrown on the overall state of AAA titles, and rightfully so. New titles regularly come out that surge strong in the opening week, and then quickly see their total player count dwindle in the coming months, until they average less than Skyrim gets, more than a decade later. It's hard to point at any one moment in the last ten years where the overall quality went away, and recognizing how old this makes me sound, the most impactful games I can remember come from about 2007 and end around 2011. There are a few notable hard hits since then, but that patch had at least one legendary title per year consistently. Halo, Bioshock, Modern Warfare, Skyrim, Red Faction, all landed one or more big hits in that period, and there are more that different communities will drive hard for. Then we entered the controversial decade from 2013-ish to now. Nobody flipped the suck switch and made everything worse all at once, but something definitely changed. Games from this point forward got gradually less ambitious. The technical quality remained high, and there were incremental improvements in that field which have continued into today but it felt like there wasn't much aggressiveness in pushing the limits, as there was in the late 2000s. Halo 4 and 5, for example, look remarkably similar from a technical standpoint. While there were improvements in frame rate and motion capture, the underlying visuals do not appear to have improved much, at least not to the average gamer. Character design and storytelling have taken a remarkably steep dive over the last decade, especially as politics and activism have started worming their way into the industry on a broad scale. These social fads aren't aging well, and definitely left a mark on titles like Horizon Zero Dawn, Mass Effect Andromeda, Spider-Man 2, Starfield, Destiny, and while these marks have not always degraded the overall feeling of these games, they have left the cultural date stamp that will probably not ever peel off, and which may well be a detriment to them as the years roll by. That's not to say that you can't court controversy in game writing. Cyberpunk 2077 combines some of the best character writing I've ever seen in a game with top-notch world-building, though it, too, suffered from the industry effects of the last decade being caught in an unfortunate industry trend that sees games commonly launch in beta condition, half-baked, and at full price. No Man's Sky, Elite Dangerous Odyssey, Anthem, Fallout 76, Battlefield 2042, all suffered from massive technical failures that a few of them never recovered from. No Man's Sky and Cyberpunk gain the honorable distinction of overcoming these flaws through significant dedication and financial sacrifice, ultimately choosing to make less money and release a better product over time. This decision has ultimately saved both games, and placed them in a stable market position that will be remembered fondly through this decade and the next, setting the stage for well-deserved sequels and long-lived IPs. Stagnation in any industry is usually the result of risk-averse funding incentives. It doesn't matter what you do or where you do it, 
technology advances incrementally over time, and it takes a lot of money to increment at all. When investors become too risk-averse, they start looking for sure shots, and in doing so, invariably fund established models that have already proven their viability. This, in turn, reduces institutional interest in new technology and in the kinds of people who can build it. Ironically, these innovators who aren't able or interested in a long career building the same game with different assets end up going off and starting their own companies revolving around new tech and ideas. The success and failure of these startups are ultimately down to the interest of typical users. Startups in gaming rarely get venture capital or investor interest, so they rely entirely on dredging that interest directly from consumers. The early access and Kickstarter concepts are a massive and often underrated innovation that emerged from social media and are facilitated through platforms like Steam. It's not a perfect system, but it does represent a huge leap forward because it provides the possibility of eliminating financial middlemen and creating a direct relationship between developers and their end customer. Input need not be filtered through an investor base for revenue impact assessments and financial viability reports. Instead, developers need only concern themselves with what their customers want and what they are able to do in the next quarter to deliver it. A large part of the reason Star Citizen has been successful up to this point is that they have learned how to set expectations correctly, maintain these expectations over time, and adjust them when necessary. While there have been many failures over the years, this effort is ultimately in good faith, and the community has responded accordingly. Calling this game a scam after more than a decade of improvement and progress is ultimately a disingenuous position. If the project fails, it won't be the result of fraud or deception. If Star Citizen succeeds, it will rest firmly atop more than a decade of research and development which no other developer is in a good position to challenge anytime soon, and from which Cloud Imperium will be able to license out these technological advancements to a whole new generation of developers, greatly enhancing the technical foundations of the industry as a whole, and demanding from its competitors a much higher standard of performance, which they will need to rapidly meet or risk irrelevancy. Should Star Engine itself become a commercial product, much the same as Unreal, Unity, and CryEngine, then all this advancement could well be in the hands of hobbyists and small business operations by the end of the decade. Though whether or not this happens is speculation. Since there are compelling arguments for Star Engine to remain proprietary and exclusive to Cloud Imperium. I hope that this is not the end goal, since remaining proprietary would reduce the pressure on existing engine developers to change by taking Star Engine out of direct competition. Either way, Star Citizen appears to be crossing a substantial tipping point. There were a lot of expectations placed on this year's CitizenCon, and most of them were met. Now a new set of ambitious expectations have been set for this next year, which, if fulfilled, will mean the largest single-year advancement in the game's technology to date. More deliverables are anticipated in the next 12 months than have ever been set, with the horizon for Squadron 42, the offline component for Star Citizen, likely to release within the next two years. It was declared feature complete over the weekend and is now in the polishing phase. If you have not yet, it's not a bad time to get into Star Citizen, but even if you decide against it, consider funding other games that you think look fun. Hits and misses abound on all publishing platforms, but win or lose, developers are only able to take risks that players are willing to back up. We can set the standards ourselves, or let them be set by Wall Street. And this last decade, Wall Street's missed more often than they've hit. That's all I have for today. Catch you all later.